All right. Well, welcome. Good afternoon. We're so glad that you have joined us today for our webinar on the intersection of mental health and sports. My name is Allison Neiman, and I'm the executive director of Mindful Philanthropy. And Mindful Philanthropy, just to give you a little bit of background, we were launched in 2020 with a mission of catalyzing impactful funding to mental health addiction and well-being. And so our work is far reaching over the last four years almost now, and we connect and convene funders through our gatherings, both in person and online, such as today. We guide philanthropic funders towards strategies and impact, um, both in our public guidance, which we're going to take a look at through the sports primer today, as well as some of our advisory guidance that we do with funders. And then we uplift impactful opportunities, such as nonprofit programs for investment by funders. So today we're going to explore sports and mental health. And we know that sports are an integral part of our culture. So whether it's the Super Bowl, um, I'm sure many of you hosted parties or attended parties over the last few days, uh, upcoming March Madness, tracking the locations of the 2026 World Cup, such as my son was, or looking forward to the launch of spring training for baseball, which was always an annual tradition in my family. Uh, many of us played sports as kids or have our own children on teams now. And sports offers not only technical skills, community, and camaraderie, but also opportunities to support the development of youth as it relates to mental health. In the course of our conversation today, we'll explore those benefits as well as challenges and potential solutions. Before we get started with our conversation and our panel of experts, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items so you know how to participate in today's event. At any time during the webinar, you'll have the opportunities to submit your questions to today's presenters. To do so, just type your question into the Q&A box at the bottom of the control panel. And as time allows, the presenters um, and Kristen, who'll be moderating our conversation, will address as many questions as they can throughout the program. We are recording the webinar and we'll share the link after the event. Um, and it'll also be shared later through our newsletter. Additionally, we'd like to point out that subtitles are available for today's discussion, and you can turn them on by clicking the closed caption button below. Please do bear in mind that they're automatically generated by Zoom in real time, so we apologize for any inaccuracies they may have. Um, so as we dive into today's discussion, I'd like to welcome our Director of Programs and Knowledge, Kristen Ward. So Kristen, I'll pass it to you, and I'll let you take away the conversation and introduce the panelists today. Great, thanks. Um, well, it's wonderful to be here and excited to, to have this opportunity to dive into the topic of sports and mental health. As Allison mentioned, this is a part of our Intersecting Impact series, um, which includes primers on various topics that mental health is intersectional with. So um, we've released to this point uh, guidance on, on women and girls' mental health, on the intersection of mental health and homelessness, as well as taking a deeper look at how mental health shows up in broad youth issues. Um, and in this guidance, we're really excited for the opportunity to dive into sports. Um, as Allison mentioned, it's such an inter instrumental opportunity to support young people's growth and development. Um, and yet mental health is not often a part of that conversation, um, but leaves so much opportunity to support the, the needs of, of young people, their families, and their communities. So as you dive into the conversation, we invite you to download the guidance um, and take a look at the, the core avenues to impact. Um, I'll say as these primer series are quite short, they're only four pages, they are just an appetizer. Um, and would love to continue to explore opportunities to dive deeper um, with folks who are interested in but as we look at this guidance, there are three core avenues that we highlight that we'll touch on in the conversation today. The first is positive youth development um, and really thinking about how sports are foundational to supporting young people and their communities. The second is the support systems, that young people don't operate in vacuums. They operate in families and schools and teams and in relationship, um, and really thinking about how we can reinforce those support systems while also equipping them to be that first line of support for young people. And then lastly, ensuring that we're cha championing sports equity, um, especially as we look across kind of the evolution of sports in our country, um, There, there's so much room uh, for improvement and expanding the reach of sports into communities that have been left behind and ensuring that all young people, regardless of their ability to pay, have opportunities to engage in youth sports as well as sports throughout the lifespan. So with that, I'm excited to welcome our panelists. Um, first, we're joined by Andrew Ladd, 
who is the co-founder of the LAD Foundation, um, which has helped to develop a program called 1616. Andrew is also a 16-year NHL veteran. He's a two-time Stanley Cup champion um, and has been involved in many nonprofits, such as the Special Olympics and Canadian mental health throughout his career. Next, we have Robert Marcus, who joins us as the Chief Community Impact Officer at the Positive Coaching Alliance. Um, there, Robert works at the forefront of the organization's efforts to eliminate the sports equity gap in low-income communities across the country. And he especially specializes in mobilizing local leaders in predominantly Black and brown neighborhoods, um, focusing on dismantling those barriers to sports participation. Then we have Dr. Sheila Olson-Walker, who's a senior scientist at the Institute for Applied Research in Youth Development at Tufts University. Um, as, a, as a lifelong competitive tennis player, Sheila brings to this conversation her first-hand knowledge um, and understanding of the power of sport um, and embedding life skills and mindsets to transfer into careers, relationships, and wellness. Um, she also brings a diverse set of experiences in behavioral genetics, as well as finance and philanthropy. And then last but not least, we have Dr. Tori Wilson, who's the Dean of Graduate School of Professional Psychology at the University of Denver. Um, and Tori is not only a psychologist but and, and the Dean of the school, um, but interestingly enough, the, the School of Professional Psychology at the University of Denver also oversees all of DU sports programs. Um, so it brings a really unique perspective to the conversation. So please help me in welcoming our, our panelists as we dive into the conversation. Great. Well, Sheila, I would love to start with you um, and really drawing on, on your diverse and extensive background, um, especially as a, a former tennis player and, and behavioral geneticist. How do you think about the intersection of sports and mental health at kind of the basis level? Well, at the base level, that's such a great question. And that's why we're all here, of course, today. Um, you know, sport is so much more than just uh sport, playing games, um, whatever your sport might be, individual or team sports. Um, it really is um, experiential education, it's preventative health. It's all these different dynamics that not only skill build for the very qualities we need, that young people need to succeed and thrive in life. Um, health is foundational to all, of course. And you know what we know about um, you know mental health, and physical health, they're really two sides of the same coin at a molecular level. You can't distinguish between the two. And so um, exercise biochemistry, staying active um, is the most powerful drug. Uh, one of the most powerful drugs there is, endogenous, you know, organic drugs there is. Um, you know, that combined with uh, social connection, um, oxytocin, uh, you know, positive biochemicals, um, they really, uh, uh, you know, embedding uh, the love of physical activity and engagement with others um, in whatever capacity uh, uh, with movement early on is, um, it is preventative health that can last for a lifetime. And what we know is when, when young people have positive experiences with movement, with sports early on, and this is in large part due to, uh, you know, the kinds of experiences they have, high quality uh, experiences, Fun is what kids want, and fun doesn't mean running around chasing butterflies. It means working hard, learning, growing, having a uh, positive coach-athlete relationship, um, having fun with their friends. Um, mm -hmm. But it is, you know, fun is aligned with, you know, what we know, uh, you know, the, the major factors that help kids grow uh, in, a, in a healthy, um, kind of a healthy, robust, and resilient manner over time. So long story short, um, you know, young people, childhood, adolescence, or what we call a sensitive period in development, where uh, habits, mindsets, behaviors are more likely to stick. Mem memory is more robust in the mind-body system. And so having positive experiences for young people early on in life helps embed this, you know, go-to for physical activity um, as, you know, as a, as a bolster for all. And again, foundation, you know, health is foundational for everything. And um, what I know about, you know, young kids being athletes and those positive experiences, consistency in sport uh, participation um, keeps kids out of trouble. The anxiety is lower, uh, depression is lower, the suicidal ideation, those kinds of statistics are all lower, productivity is higher, and they're more likely to stay active as adults too throughout life. So it's all 
a positive and it really is not about competition. It's not about winning trophies or college scholarships. A minute percentage of kids go on to do those kinds of things. Um, it's really about building habits that support a, a healthy, happy, uh, robust, productive and purposeful lifestyle. Yeah, absolutely. Sheila, you touched on so many incredible points there. And I think at the at the basis here, it's about building that foundation, whether that be the biological foundation or those skills and routines and opportunities and relationships and thinking about setting that forth in the earliest days and providing greater opportunity for that and then continuing to reinforce that through time for greater mental health. Tori, I would love to turn to you um, and given your work at the collegiate level and, and your history in this space as a psychologist, I'm curious what challenges you have observed in athletes and, and young people more generally today, um, thinking about not only the collegiate level, but from the lowest levels of recreation to collegiate athletes and, and how are institutions responding to those needs? Hi, Kristen, thank you. Um... I guess I'd start with the, the, an understanding that we want to think about behavioral health rather than just the notion of mental health, because mental health has this connotation of, you know, that we're dealing with issues related to um, what we traditionally think of as more psychiatric or psychological issues, as opposed to just the broad range of behaviors that are part of our functioning and existing, with, of course, the continuum including mental health issues. Um, we see a reflection of the broader society. Um, a lot of historical mental health issues that become more salient hit kids at about the age they start college, but we've had a 20, 30 year period of a steady increase in disorders being diagnosed with young folks and um, being primarily treated through medication as opposed to interventions that might have a more profound and consistent impact. So what we've seen is an accumulative effect at the collegiate level, where all of the things that we've talked about basically since just before the pandemic, which got, I guess, magnified, what's a more appropriate term, I guess, um, weaponized by the pandemic. And there are multiple reasons for that. Um, the isolation certainly contributed to it. But we've also, in some ways, as a society, set up our young folks to be in this position. Because, you know, I've I've spent, I've actually traveled abroad quite a bit over the last few few months since um, October. And other parts of the world aren't seeing the same levels that we do. And part of it is a lot of the traditional ways in which we engage and allowed for recreation and sport to be a part of our kids' lives has been reduced. Um, so it's it's really kind of this effect that has hit at almost a perfect storm. Um, someone mentioned atmospheric um, rivers. Um, now we've got a, a nor'easter of different factors that have contributed to our kids and young folks having a a new and more focused level of I think uh, mental health and behavioral health challenges. The collegiate level has been in some ways similar to what I saw when I worked in adolescent health years ago, interventions at the school level are most important because a lot of folks start to see these things and have opportunities to identify and intervene. Um, so we have sports psychologists, sports performance um, folks, particularly D1 universities, but we're starting to see it across the landscape, whereas understood it's not just about how you better their performance. It's also essential to the well-being of these young athletes and these young folks. Um, the challenge is the service and the need for services have increased at an exponential point. So yeah. how do you provide and build capacity, both in terms of day-to-day -day students, but also with athletes who do have unique pressures, a unique set of expectations, um, I met with one of our graduates who is a sports psychologist with a pro team, and I mentioned this in one of our conversations earlier this week, um, just the profound impact that social media could have on one's functioning and well-being and what is needed to help find a balance when a, a young athlete might see all these negative comments from these anonymous sources out there in the, the, the um, you know, internet 
and how that can change both how they experience themselves and ultimately affect their 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 performance as well. So all those things are tied together. Absolutely. And we're trying to be at the forefront of addressing and making sure that the appropriate people are in place to do it. And during the introduction, we're not just psychologists with sports performance people. We also have a sports coaching master's program and we have a kinesiology program. So it's this integrative approach to how do we understand health in a broader, more integrative way. Absolutely. And thank you for, for noting that. I think those are really interesting components of the work that you're doing. And you hit on so many incredible points here. And I think that that what I, um, I'm kind of lifting up is for the audience is how multifaceted um, the intersectionality is between mental health and sports. And not only does it serve as an opportunity to prevent and support young people and their families in our community, but also really strong opportunities to intervene and to provide support for those who are in need that is both clinical and non-clinical. So to your point around kind of medications and other interventions that are available, that sport can be in a way a cure or a support for, for mental health challenges in concert with those other um, other mental health supports that, that may be able to be provided more clinically in nature. Um, but really it's just so bi-directional as we think about the relationship between well-being and performance um, and how, how prominent that comes up is in the sports atmosphere. Andrew, would love to turn to you now as a former professional athlete and, and competing at such high levels. Um, how has your experience with mental health throughout your career informed how you're approaching your current work with youth? Yeah, when I, when I look back at my, my career as a whole and how, I guess, my evolution through that process, um, at a very young age, you know, really the first 15 years of my career, I, I was very intentional with my physical health, you know, the skills of playing the sport, how I was keeping my body prepared to play the sport. Um, ultimately, until I, I hit a wall where I, you know, and like one, I should say one of the, the best things about sports is it, it can expose your gaps, right? Expose your growth areas. So for at the end of my career, um, it really exposed my lack of um, intention with my mental health and treating my brain as a muscle like I would my body. Um, so, you know, in, in, in working with a performance coach, uh, I really highlighted the areas that um, were opportunities for me to grow as a person, um, as an athlete, um, and the cumulative effects of all those things. Um, so for me, how that informed, you know, what we're doing now is the realization that, okay, can we do that, be that intentional with kids and, and how we prepare them at a young age, um, and help them understand that, Hey, their brain is a muscle and there's things that you are strong at. There's things that need improvement. Um, and sports has a, there's a valuable part of sports that can highlight those things and, and open the door to improve and, and beyond that, hey, can we help the, the, their ecosystem around them support, support that growth? Um, so it really got my brain thinking about, hey, how can we be proactive about getting these skills to kids at, at, at a younger age? Because I felt the, the effects of neglecting that for so long or just being blind to that, I guess I would say, uh, for so long in, in, in my career. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, that there's a really important point there in terms of the lack of intentionality that we have when we think about our mental performance in, in light of our physical performance and that we so often prioritize um, the, the athletic performance without appreciating how your, your mental well-being and your mental health plays into that. And I, I think about it in my own experience that so much of sport is a mental game. Um, but that carries on over into um, kind of the broader mental and behavioral health challenges that you experience outside of, of the sport environment. Yeah. And I think like, there's so many different opportunities within sports, right? There's always another play. There's always another game. There's another practice. Um, so the, the opportunity to have a sh you know, short memory and, and change your approach the next day and practice different things um, and work on all those things is, is, uh, is unique. Absolutely. 
Robert, now turning to you and your role of overseeing community impact um, at Positive Coaching Alliance, what drives your dedication to narrowing the sports equity and access gap for youth in, in disinvested communities? And what insights can you share about the needs and priorities that you're hearing from these communities, really being able to lift up their voices and, and what you're finding in those conversations? I mean, such a complicated question, but thank you. I think the dedication, I mean, it really stems from the belief that like every child deserves the opportunity to experience the positive benefits of sports, right? Regardless of their social, social or economic status, right? I think uh, our other panel, the other panelists have already articulated, right? The role that sports play, that crucial role in developing lifelong healthy habits, including obviously the physical and mental well-being of the ch of children that we hope to support. But what we know is that there are significant disparities when it comes to accessing those positive be benefits. Kids in low-income communities, specifically low-income communities of color, are far less likely to participate in sport. They, they drop out of sport because of the systems that sport evolve around and due to cost or financial barriers or transportation um, in far greater numbers than you know, their more affluent or resource peers. So, I mean, I think it's, it's really challenging and it's really multifaceted. Um, but what we've learned uh, in, in terms of insights, kids in disinvested communities, coaches in disinvested communities, marginalized communities, however you want to frame it, the challenges are complex. Again, they, they range from financial, lack of avail available coaches, infrastructure. So with that being the case, I think there continues to be a strong desire for positive, equitable, and accessible youth sports experiences. And I think we all have an obligation for those of us who believe that, again, if we're talking about mental health today, that sports play a, a positive role in the mental health and the development of children, I think we have an, op an obligation to address that sports equity gap, or again, those disparities in access that disproportionately impact low-income kids uh, the most. Absolutely. I think that's one of the, the biggest flags that we see in this space is really that lack of opportunity. And that if this is is such an important and instrumental place to support uh, youth well-being and development and then lifelong mental health, that we have to create greater opportunity. Sheila, can you, you talked a little bit in your introduction around kind of the, the intersection of mental health and physical health and thinking around kind of the, the scientific relationship. Can you share a little bit more about kind of um, what you have seen in, in this scientific relationship, both in your athletic career, as well as your, in your study of behavioral genetics, as we think about both those protective factors and those risk factors associated with mental health and sports? Well, so the, I'll just start here with this basic. Um, you know, I'm a behavioral geneticist. I work in a big twin study looking at how nature and nurture operate together. And what we know is that nurture shapes nature across life. It is this, this field called epigenetics where all of our experiences, um, how active we are, the nature of our social relationships, stress, sleep, uh, toxins, all those things, they shape how our genes are uh, read, transcribed, and expressed. And that in turn shapes um, our physiology, neurophysiology on the inside, which shapes you know, what shows up on the outside. And um, it, you just, it's mental health and physical health, behavioral health, Tori, it's a, it's a, it's a larger umbrella. And I think that's the, the very appropriate way to look at it. And that's uh, the way in which Tom Insel, um, former director of the N National Institute for Mental Health, um, uh, refers to it. So it's it's a it's a broader umbrella, but they all it's na like nature and nurture. You can't pull these things apart. They're not different categories or buckets of things that that exist in some kind of isolation. They're all related, and one affects the other. And so um, you know, as related to sports, it is this incredibly underutilized developmental context that should be available for all young people. Access is a major issue. All the things that Robert mentioned, in addition to transportation, and they're just, there's so many different ways in which um, sports needs to be elevated for young people. And that really starts with understanding what sports is, this, this kind of 3.0 story of sports. It's much bigger than just sports. It really is a means to an end. 
it's an experiential education and it's preventative health. And so um, I think my, my greatest hope, you know, is that collectively we can raise awareness about what this story is um, and, uh, and, and get cross-sector funding in place because, you know, public health is very much a part of the equation here. You look at metrics for kids who are active, who start early, who remain engaged in sports, have positive relationships with their coaches. And they, you know, just the long, the long game is, is, uh, you know, is markedly different from kids who are, you know, um, not engaged in health promoting activities where they're learning life skills and growth mindset and, and so forth. And they're stuck on screens. And we know, you know, sports is yeah. a wonderful context that you can't do both. And so we know that, you know, screens are a massive part of what is continues to propel, um, you know, mental unwellness for young people, behavioral unwellness. So um, we've really got to look at this bigger holistic picture and um, think of how we can activate sport um, really in service of, of healthy whole child development, which starts with mental, physical, behavioral health at the foundation. Yeah, that's that's absolutely um, so important to think about and really thinking about all of the different factors that influence our, our engagement in sports, but then also kind of the, the lifelong um, positive benefits that sports provide us. Um, in, in a number of our conversations, we've talked about kind of the three-legged stool and, and supporting young people in sports has to include also conversations around supporting parents and coaches and kind of family in the community so that it can't just be the young person that is the, the central focus of this work. Um, so maybe Andrew, starting with you, what are some of the approaches that you have taken in pairing support for youth as well as their families and coaches and thinking about that, that three-legged stool. Yeah. I, I think one of the first things was realizing that if we want to impact the, the child, like we also have to provide support and education to the parents and the coaches. Um, so, so that, that was the first thing I think as we've gone along, we've realized um, really just almost the lack of education in the space. Like, you know, I, I know I have conversations with my kids and sometimes I'm searching to understand, okay, what do I say to this child right now? Cause I want to have the impact of helping him understand or her understand um, the best way to proceed. So, and, and we usually, you know, the, the reaction would be to like coach how we were coached or parent how we were parented. Um, so really providing uh, the, the concept and here's why it's important and here's how you can support your child in this process. So that's that's been our uh, approach, um, but really it's it's providing them with the resources so that they have the ability to support their their child as they're navigating a lot of challenges that that come up not only in sport but but life as well. Yeah, and we've talked about this in terms of kind of the the mental health education and skills building and, and literacy around it. It's that you can't teach a, a young person that without also sharing that with their parents, because if they go home and they try to practice their skills or use their new language and their parents can't speak to them, it creates um, a, another challenge to overcome. So making sure that there are opportunities to integrate the whole family and the whole team and the whole kind of culture and community into those conversations is, is really important. Yeah. But I, I think like there's so many unique opportunities in sport of, of, you know, uh, between shifts, you know, or the car rides home or just different conversations, like going to the rink and, you know, your, your, your athlete having a tough game, like those, there's moments in there that um, if we can prepare parents and coaches for those moments and, and preload them and have have them understand why those moments are important, uh, again, it, that, that intentionality will lead to, to better results in, in my mind. That's great. Absolutely. Robert, since since coaching really is the focus of, of so much of your work with the Positive Coaching Alliance, can you talk a little bit about how quality and style of coaching intersects with the mental well-being of athletes at, at all ages and levels? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, our organization, we train tens of thousands of coaches in positive youth development around the country every single year. And I think the quality of coaching is absolutely critical to the mental well-being of athletes, regardless of level, right? I think 
coaches play that pivotal role of creating a positive sports experience that supports mental health, you know, by emphasizing some of the things you heard uh, Sheila talk about earlier, right? Emphasizing effort, learning, you know, bouncing back from mistakes. I think high quality coaching really involves understanding the individual needs of the kids and the athletes that we support, you know, and promote that resilience and fostering that sense of belonging and connection that's critical to mental health. Um, I'm, but I think that approach, obviously, it, it enhances like the mental health components, but also their athletic performance as well and contributes to their overall development. But I, I, I would note that like it's critical to invest in the educational components for coaches, right? Like when you think about from the youth perspective, where are most kids in this country outside of the classroom, right? They're, they're typically engaged in some type of out of school time athletic pursuit is probably the largest gathering space for kids outside of the classroom. But when you look with the look at the coaches who support and craft those environments, it's some of the least invested in develop you know, in terms of professional development. Uh, some of the least uh, professional development is happening in those spaces. So, like investing in that is, I think, absolutely critical to support the environments that that create some of the conditions that we've been talking about here today is from a, from a mental health, behavioral health perspective. Yeah, absolutely. And I think to, to Andrew's point around kind of coaching the way that you were coached or parenting the way that you were parenting, I think it also presents a really important opportunity to break some of those cycles and to provide support and reinforcement for more of those positive um, coaching approaches. And, and somebody in the question um, asked about the, um, the, the move toward kind of win at all costs approach and thinking around um, the need for greater support and, and equitable opportunities for young people to engage in recreational sports. Um, and we, we sometimes talk about kind of the hyper-professionalization of sports and that so often young people are, are cut out of opportunities to engage in sports early on because of either the cost or because of the kind of hyper-professionalization and working toward that win at all costs. So ensuring that not only do you provide the kind of system level opportunities, but also support coaches in making folks feel included and feeling that they belong, even if they, they don't get as much playing time or they um, may not feel as, as high of, of skilled as some of their other teammates. No doubt. I think it's, you know, it's, it's how we want to approach it. I mean, one, from a systems perspective, if we don't get kids involved in sports early, the likelihood of them to continue that will diminish as they get older. Um, so we want to create those access points. But at the same time, you have to address the whole system. If they're not experienced, so like you have to address the access barriers. But if we don't address the experience, the experiential barriers at the same time, like are they going to want to continue to participate? So like taking that holistic approach to sport is something that I think it, at, at our, our organization, we, we, we pride ourselves on, but we, at the same time, we think it's absolutely critical to support the development of our young people, especially our most, our, our most vulnerable kids who, who definitely need those opportunities. Yeah. And that framing is really helpful in terms of both the, the access barriers and the experiential barriers. Tori, I'd like to, to turn to you and thinking about the work that the Graduate School of Professional Psychology does um, at the University of Denver and all of the, the different programs that are housed within that school, um, not only the sports programs, but all of the, the many training training programs for um, the, the various kind of programs that you have and thinking about the behavioral health workforce shortage that we have in our country. Um, and how we we see an opportunity to think about other types of, of organizations and other types of personnel to provide support to young people. Can you maybe speak to thinking about kind of the, the different training programs that you have and how there are um, so many opportunities to reinforce kind of those initial level supports for young people and, and adults even across the continuum as it relates to sports? Sure. Um, one, one of the things that was triggered listening to Robert as well as Andrew and everyone else's comments, the there's a part of, you know, Brian Garrity, who's the ch director of sports coaching program and really the founder and developed the program and is very um, much more um, capable of talking about this than I am. 
But he talks about the fact that we have no regulations on who can become a coach, what it means to be a professional coach. And if, um, you know, during our conversations, it triggers my thoughts of my football coaches that I grew up with, my baseball coaches who happen to be a little bit better, and some even track when I ran track. Um, in hindsight, my coaches were kind of out there and, and had no skill set beyond maybe X's and O's. And talk about an opportunity, again, has been touched upon to have either a profoundly positive or negative impact on not just how you think about yourself as an athlete, but how you think about yourself as a person. That is a tremendous amount of power that we just lead to chance, which is, as was said, parenting is similar. Um, dare I quote an early Keanu Reeves line from Parenthood? You need a license to fish, a license to hunt, a license to drive. Anybody with the equipment can become a parent. Well, coaching ain't a whole lot different, right? All you have to do is show an interest and step up in some situations. And you have this group of young folks whose lives you can have a meaningful impact, good or bad. Now, with that, it is, I think, unique that sports coaching, not so much sports performance, sports psychology, because that program is really married and understanding how those two intersect. And then now we have kinesiology, um, which is unique in that we're trying to understand and approach health, as I said earlier, from a more integrative, holistic standpoint. Um, across the lifespan, you know, we talk, again, go back, an epidemic of mental health issues. We also have an epidemic of obesity, childhood diabetes, um, type two. Um, that is directly attributable to an absence of activity and engagement, um, which also has an impact on one's behavioral health and mental health development. If you're not feeling healthy in your body, it's kind of difficult to feel. We, have, we know that there's a direct link with depression and anxiety with those things. So how can we be a multiplier, a workforce increaser, and understanding the relationship between all of these things while still understanding that there's always going to be the consequence. But I am very invested in the notion of how do we prevent these things? Why do we wait for folks to develop unhealthy habits, unhealthy ways of being? We need to be at the forefront of understanding what are the ways that we affect change, affect health from birth throughout the lifespan. So I, I think, again, this is a very unique place in terms of we have those things while we're also adding other health-related um, programs, or that's the plan, because I think we have to be engaged in it. We know how to make people healthy, theoretically. We know what the medical interventions are, yet we still heart disease is still the number one killer in the U.S. We have all of the technologies from medication to dietary interventions. So why are we still so poor at it? Because we don't address the behavioral component. We also don't address what contributes to it starting at an early stage of life. We just wait for it to happen. And then we try to retool. Resilience is something you begin to learn at a very early age. There's a bunch of research now on resilience as if we can retrofit folks with resilience. You can gain resilience. That is not just about how do you persist and engage in sport, but how do you live and attribute it to other aspects of your life through these types of things, through the activities? And I, I love Robert's, um, why aren't we making sure that this is a part of multiple communities? It shouldn't just be access to communities and means. It should, or when we pick that kid at an early age that we know has potential, and we're gonna pluck him out and put him in a different environment, if we care about kids, if we care about health, then we're, we're developing and understanding that we need to do a better job across cultures, across socioeconomic status, and not just the ones that we think might be the next superstar, the next this. So I yeah. think hopefully that answers your question. No, it does. I think it's really, really important. And you continually emphasize really the power of sport in in so many different ways, as we think about the physical benefits and all of the the other compounding health challenges that you mentioned, and it kind of brings to me the the kind of 
brain gut access research that's going on and thinking around kind of the intersection of, of um, issues that are, are present in in our, our gastrointestinal challenges, as well as our brain and the combination of, um, for example, diverticulitis and depression. Um, and I think that as we look at mental health, we see so many opportunities to support, but really need to focus in on, on prevention and not waiting until 14 or 25 to start to intervene, but really laying that foundation. Um, as we think about the power of sport, however, we also have to acknowledge some of the risk factors. And, and there are a number of questions around kind of the, the coach-parent relationships. There are also kind of questions around um, some of the risk factors in sports and, and level of intimacy between kind of coach and, and athlete relationships um, and, and thinking about safety. So I'm curious, Sheila, if you could um, speak to how we can effectively mitigate some of these risk factors or, or what are some of those risk factors that we see in, in sports as it relates to um, various dynamics and, and ensuring that we have safe sports um, across the, the spectrum, and then mitigating those risk factors and, and amplifying protective factors to ensure that we can pro promote safety in sports. Thank you. Um, you know, that's it's, it's safety has to come first for healthy child development, period, end of statement. And, um, you know, you, you, in the last question you asked me, you asked a bit about my own experience as an athlete, but I, I, I still play tennis. I compete still. Uh, I play for my mental health, behavioral health. I feel better always when I come off the court than when I went on. Um, you know, the parents aren't thinking about these kind of long game kinds of goals often in coaches. They're thinking more short term on things. But um, relationships are, you know, fundamental in all of this is three legged stool. And there is a unique relationship between a coach uh, and an athlete that is that must be a safe must be a safe space. Um, I had the unfortunate experience of a sexual abuse experience with my coach at age 15 that was, uh, you know, it, it derailed my development junior year of high school. Senior year was a complete train wreck in every possible way. And, you know, um, people were asking, you know, really kind of, you know, what's wrong with her rather than what happened to her, which is, you know, it was um, it was the way things were handled back then. It was all, you know, kind of kept under wraps and there were no systems in place to report it out. Um, I was a little person we had, we had, and my family had no power, no kind of big social connections. And so it was just it was it was it was incredibly hard. And it's, it's the reason I, I do the work that I do now is to help make sports safer and better for young people, because despite that experience, it was a coach and then another adult um, who, you know, who loved me for who I was, didn't care about my performance as an athlete that helped bring me back. And that's always kind of non-negotiable factor number one in, you know, in what helps kids thrive and kids who have suffered trauma or adverse childhood experiences. Um, you know, there is there is intimacy built into coach athlete relationships. It's a, a unique kind of a relationship and safety must come first in those relationships. So certainly sports can be a place where children, and there's data on this, team sports, individual sports, children can heal from ACEs, build those re resilience factors, start developing a different story about themselves and what's possible for them um, through the conduit of sports. I certainly did that. And sports for me was my most important developmental context by a long shot, much more than school. First generation American, my family had very little when they moved here, nothing really. And, um, you know, sport that got me places that I didn't really belong on paper. And I think taught me the skills to, um, you know, to have a successful career and a healthy life and healthy children and and, and so forth. So, you know, getting uh, supporting organizations like U.S. Center for Safe Sport, making sure that safety is you know, part of every coach's training, even at the at the volunteer level. Um, coaches need to understand healthy boundaries because in the end, sports can be an incredibly, so there are ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, and then there are PACEs. These are protective and compensatory experiences. And we need to move the needle over from ACEs for, you know, kind of healing from ACEs, certainly not instigating ACEs on the coach's side of things to being a PACE for a young person, especially those most vulnerable children who need those experiences most at this time in their life when it can matter the most. 
Yeah, it's incredibly important and really thinking about how to how to approach these challenges and thinking about the training opportunities at the the coach and the the athlete level to support greater knowledge and awareness um, and skills to to say something or to to kind of elevate an issue if you if you see something to say something and it's not just on kind of the coach but it's it's a cultural um, uh, shift that that needs to happen happen in, in all settings, um, but we can't put the, the onus on individuals who are experiencing those challenges. It has to be a collective approach. I could pop in one more quick thing. I was yeah, at a, a com medical conference at the Olympic Training Center last week, and um, the CEO of uh, U.S. Center for Safe Sport, Jerice Colon, spoke and gave some statistics. There's new stats coming out, but you know, over a third of athletes report having experienced sexual abuse, and that is affecting their mental health negatively. 93% of athletes um, are uh, have a fear of retribution from the coaches, so they don't, they you know, they're just, they, there is a tendency not to report, and there is much more abuse going on that they see that athletes are aware of, they haven't experienced themselves, so these numbers are, you know, these are, these are um, underrepresentative numbers for, you know, what is really happening in some contexts, and this just has to be cleaned up in sports. For sports to be what it can be, this needs to be cleaned up. Absolutely. No, I think those are really, really important points. Um, I know that we're coming to kind of our, our final 10 minutes together, um, and there, there are so many great questions in the, the Q&A um, that I know Andrew has popped in a few qu answers to, um, so so we'll continue to try to, to integrate those questions into the conversation, um, but I want to turn to kind of really focusing on the opportunities for philanthropy, um, and Rob, you elevated two really important, I think, avenues as we think about access barriers and how we eliminate those access barriers, while also addressing the experiential barriers or challenges related to mental health in sports. Um, can you speak a little bit to opportunities to innovate or advance equity in providing youth with greater access to the mental health benefits of sports and really through the lens of what can philanthropy do to advance mental health support and, and through sports? Yeah, it's such a heavy question. I think when you think about innovate and advance equity, like one of the things that I, in terms of opportunities, is I always encourage folks to look at youth sports as a system, right? And a system is built for functionality and not equity, right? So to address equity within the system, you have to address its related parts and you have to address the system as a whole. So one of the biggest opportunities involves embracing, in my mind, a collective impact cross-sector approach within youth sports to address the systemic barriers, right? Uh, a huge barrier to eliminating inequities is the siloed approach that is often taken to address it. It's, it's collective action through cross-sector collaboration with, and I want to stress, diverse stakeholders. That's an approach that, that, in my mind, can lead to sustainable change, right? So when you think about, like, each of us on this panel in our respective roles with our respective organizations, like it's not just our responsibility to address the equity gaps that exist in sports. Um, what are the roles of the local business community if you wanna take a, a hyper-localized approach, right? What is the role of professional sports franchises? What are the roles of the school district, the parks and recs, the youth sports organizations? And if you get actors within that ecosystem to move in alignment, and just assume, let's just assume in the local youth sport ecosystem, we are all valuing mental health and the benefits that sports, the role of sports play in, in creating those mental health benefits, we can start to get some traction, right? Some investment, some, some shared momentum. Um, so I think that's absolutely critical. Now to your second question, which is you know, far more complicated, you know, about the role of philanthropy. I mean, I think it's pretty clear philanthropy can play a pivotal role in reducing the sports equity gap. Um, but I think the focus you know, needs to be around, like, again, standing up those cross-sector collaborations that I talked about earlier, like specifically those designed to, again, to stimulate collective action. And I want to stress capacity building, right? Like inv if investments are targeting the capacity of those youth sports organizations who are on the front lines of this to better support equitable access, and, and, and support the, the, the positive youth development and mental health development of our 
of our kids, we start to see some change. I think there's a big opportunity there through the investment in those cross-sector collaboratives, right? Because if we believe that youth sports has these pos- or have these positive benefits, mental health or otherwise, I think supporting this type of approach can help, you know, equip providers in these spaces to build their internal capacity to meet the demand that we know exists. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it comes from that education and awareness, but then also being able to provide the the directional opportunities so that we actually have the skills and resources to be able to support young people when when there is a challenge um, and equipping all of those people around young people with with that knowledge. Yeah, I mean, because if we're if we if you think about philanthropy, if we continue and I, I'm not saying don't fund one off approaches, but if all we fund is one off approaches, I mean, how sustainable is that? for for long-term impact. For sure. No, and I think the systems approach is necessary because youth sports is a system, recreation is a system, but we need to think about it more as kind of a cross-functional system and how to to come to this. And Sheila made the point earlier around the, the health funders or the public health funders and the education funders and how we can bring so many more resources and more funders to the conversation. Um, in, a, in our kind of final few minutes together, I'm curious if each of you can and can focus on um, kind of one one kind of primary philanthropic opportunities that you would want to emphasize as we think about how to leverage greater mental health support for our youth, thinking about the collegiate athletes and beyond. So not just um, not specifically an organization, but if you if we could walk away kind of with the the top line um, piece that you want our participants to to step away with today, like what would you direct their attention to as we think about how philanthropy can better support mental health for for young people um, across the the lifespan? For me, it's it's I think the challenge in the space is there's not instant gratification of say we're gonna send this many meals to this many kids, um, right? People can see that impact with. Yeah. In this space, it's hard, like we might not see the impact for five, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, so it's almost that innovative for innovative uh, forward approach of, of uh, entrepreneurship in this, being able to see the value of, of laying the groundwork right now at that youth sports level. Um, so that, you know, in 10, 20 years, we'll look back and realize, hey, this was the, the most valuable investment we've made in the last, you know, however many years. Thank you, Andrew. I think that's a really important point. Tori, maybe you could jump in. Another big question, right? Um, I love big questions. You know, we claim to be so invested and care so much about kids and children and young folk. Then put your money where your mouth is. Even if it's small, but certainly large helps if you're going to scale things up. But Is it meaningful to say I'm going to invest in building effective and efficient programs to ensure that we are helping our young folks to lead healthy and productive lives, knowing that sport has a direct impact and saying I can be a part of this, not just because I want these kids to hold up the trophy, but because I want them to win in other ways? yeah, I'm, I'm frequently told, well, kids sell in terms of the work that we do. Well, yeah, they sell on paper, but how do we make that a reality so that folks are understanding, as Andrew said, this impact, we don't do well with delayed gratification in, in the U.S., and it is a delayed process. Um, as a clinician, I, I may not see the kid I work with um, except for when now, of course, they can find you anywhere. <laughs> and the story I tell is I, I worked in New York with at-risk youth back in the late 80s. And this young lady who I worked with at 14 found me 20 years later and shared with me the impact that the work we did had on her life. Um, I wouldn't have known that if she hadn't reached yeah. out, but there's always that hope that that impact is there. Yeah. We have to re-educate folks and, and, and funders that, yeah, you may not see that shiny thing immediately, but is it worth the investment? Yeah, for sure. Robert and and Sheila, final words. Oh, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I just, 
I'd like to echo um, Dr. Wilson's sentiments. I think like if the sector understood, and I think it does to an extent, um, but like kids don't operate in silos, right? Like I think that's that's very important to note. And, you know, putting our money where our mouth is and, and investing in the development of, of the whole ecosystem of sport um, will, will allow for some of the long-term sustainable changes that we we hope to see. And I, I love what, what Tori noted around like that delayed gratification, right? Like if you're coaches or mentors, right? You're not, at the end of the day, that's what a coach is in my mind. And I think that if, if we think that impact is going to, if we think that impact is going to be immediate, it's not always immediate. We're not building widgets that we can sell and then count in terms of the successes that we create. That impact is, is, is linear, it's longitudinal. And then, so, so designing interventions and, and, and investing in those interventions with that in mind, I think will, will, will be quite transformative if that becomes the norm. Absolutely. Thank you. So at a, at a brain health conference in, in Washington a few years ago, uh, it was specifically on cognitive decline, dementia, Alzheimer's, the top three factors that mitigate, that, that make for better outcomes are one, doing something physically active every day, that exercise biochemistry, two, having uh, reliable social connections, um, vital as we age in particular, and then the third is having a sense of purpose sense of belonging, something bigger than ourselves to get out of bed for in the morning. So if we start there and then backward map to youth sports and, and we think about, you know, the cost, the mental, physical cost, the quality of life cost, health insurance, chronic disease, you know, mental health and, and chronic disease are 90% of our healthcare spend and, 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 you know, a, a much smaller percentage of that is related is goes towards um, mental health. Um, so, you know, I think really coming up with a strategic roadmap, thinking top down at a systems level in this very, very fragmented profit driven industry of sports right now, we need to think as a team. And um, you said it so well, Robert, um, get the actors in the ecosystem to act in alignment. And so um, this is this is what we need to do. Um, and I'm actually starting work on a project with University of Denver and Aspen Institute's Project Play to do something like this in Colorado, starting this fall, where we can you know engage Positive Coaching Alliance, you know, all of your resources and your educators and your philosophy and uh, Andrew's 1616 content for for parents and uh, coaches and athletes and get the data that we need to really begin to solve the solve for the issues, uh, get long-term cross-sector funders involved by helping them understand a different story um, about what sports is and how, how it'll make a difference for them um, economically, so. That's wonderful, thank you, Sheila. And, and there's so many incredible opportunities that we've heard from today. So I just wanna thank again, our panelists, uh, for such a rich conversation. And hopefully this is the, the first of many before I turn it over to, to Allison to close for today. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. And thank you to all of our panelists. Um, it was such a rich conversation. And um, I just want to articulate and highlight something that was said at the end, really around that cross-sector collaboration, that it is going to take um, breaking down the silos and collaborating together to really change the system. And when we do backward map, Sheila, I'm so glad you did that and highlighted that. And what is the role of funders and philanthropy? And so right now we're launching a poll um, right into the, um, the chat right here. And so if you're interested in continuing the conversation, we would love for you to fill this out so that we can pull together a, a more intimate conversation around what the role of philanthropy is in breaking down the silos and starting to map those systems change efforts. Um, so we would really encourage you just to put your name in there, your organization we will reach out to schedule a follow-up meeting. Um, so we'll leave that open for a few more seconds, probably another minute as you fill that out. Um, the second thing is just if you have not already had a chance to do so, we will drop the primer link that Kristen highlighted at the beginning of the conversation into the chat. Um, it has a lot of good nuggets just to kind of whet your appetite, um, but we also encourage you to pass that link on to anyone else. 
um, in your organization or to other friends and funders. Um, and then lastly, as we close out our time, there is a lot of momentum around this conversation and we look forward to being in touch, but we also look, we enjoy hearing feedback from you all on how the webinars and the things that we're doing impact your philanthropy and your work. And so we would appreciate you taking a few minutes um, to fill that out so that we can continue to get better at what we're doing. So thank you so much. I see people are still kind of filling out the, um, the poll so that we can get another meeting together. I want to thank all of our panelists again for their time and their skills and their expertise. We're grateful for you joining us. And for all of you that joined us today, um, please reach out to us so that we can get another meeting scheduled. And we look forward to, for those of you just that are watching the webinar, because we did have quite a few people that were looking for the webinar um, and the recording. So if you're not able to participate in the poll, please reach out to us at info at mindfulphilanthropy.org and we'll make sure that you get incorporated into that conversation. So thank you. Have a great day, everyone. We'll see you soon.